Welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. For decades, international charity Orbis UK have been saving the sight of children and adults and empowering communities with the skills and resources necessary to fight blindness on their own. At the heart of Orbis is the world's only flying eye hospital. Once used for cargo, the Orbis DC-10 is kitted out as an operating theatre, teaching facility, recovery room and ophthalmic hospital. Its success relies on volunteer surgeons, anaesthetists and medical teams to fly to places like Ethiopia, Vietnam, Peru to train local doctors and nurses, as well as carry out life-saving surgery. Well, today I'm in North London in the company of a valued member of Team Orbis, Dr. Manish Raval, a consultant anaesthetist from world-renowned Moorfields Eye Hospital, to find out more about his own decade-long volunteering journey and the incredible work he's part of. Manish, thank you so much for finding time today. Have we caught you on a busy day? Are you just back from the hospital? No, not at all. I've actually just returned to the dentist, one of those practical chores that you have to complete somewhere in the week. And I've had a little bit of sofa time with my son, so I'm actually very comfortably relaxed. Good. Thank so you. you haven't just whipped out of the operating theatre to come and record Thankfully your not. podcast. But tell me, first of all, a bit about life at, at Moorfields and your role. So I'm a consultant anaesthetist. I have been so since 2005. Makes me feel very old. And at that time, I worked both part-time at Moorfields and part-time at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospitals. And it was great. Both hospitals or both trusts as they are, were really, really exciting places to be. And as a consultant, newly qualified, I was thrilled. It was a real opportunity to do the work you trained for. After about 10 years, I found myself a little bit overwhelmed with two jobs a young son and a wife who probably quite reasonably said, being a bit neglectful here, so make a choice. And reasonably sensibly, I feel, I gave up the guys and Tom's job, stayed with more wheels, and there I have a, a more controlled life now. And as a result, I have opportunities and time to do other things, and they give me a lot of satisfaction. So I have time for my family. I have time to act as an examiner for the Royal College of Anaesthetists, which is incredibly satisfying. It's all about shaping future doctors. I volunteer for a grassroots organization called GASP, Greener Anesthesia Sustainability Project, which is all about making healthcare sustainable. And I get to work with Orbis, which is probably the, the real highlight because these are the times that you take all the skills and all the learning you've had for so long and make it really count because what you're doing is not just delivering a sort of care to patients. You're sharing your skills, you're sharing your knowledge, you're sharing your experience with people who are really, really receptive because they don't really have that much in the way of opportunity to see other doctors work with other teams or just feel like they've been nurtured. I think it's 11 years now that I've volunteered with Orbis. I've been to several countries. I started in Mongolia and since then I've been to Peru, to Vietnam, to China, to Ghana, to Zambia and even to Jamaica. And they all offer something different, something exciting. Uh, it's about the people, it's about the culture, it's about the interaction you have sometimes more challenging than other places. The language can be a burden and a hurdle. The sort of cultural sensitivities can make you feel, mm, I'm not sure how to behave. But the basic working is the basic working. And all doctors, I think anywhere in the world, will generally have a sense of camaraderie. They will generally have a sense of mutual respect and a desire to try and bond in a way that's going to just serve the patient. And as you said there, it's the teaching as well, isn't it? So it's not just going in, carrying out surgery, helping to save people's sight. It is about enabling the local community to do more themselves. That must be very satisfying for you to pass on your learnings and know that what you can pass on in those communities can be used hundreds of times over. That's definitely true, without a doubt. As a consultant in the NHS, your job is not just to deliver healthcare, it's to deliver training to your successors. So hopefully we become better at it. I would say hopefully. We all have our own style and our own manner in doing so. But I generally tend to get a fairly receptive feel from the trainees I'm with that I'm, I make it interesting and I make it useful for them. So now taking that and delivering it elsewhere in the world is just what Orbis is trying to do. It really is the bottom line for Orbis because there are many charities that will try and serve healthcare to another country. 
And it's just a passing kind of entity. It just it delivers care to a handful of patients and then you move on. But the Orbis is all about the legacy, the posterity, the, the sense that you go, you work alongside, you try and empower, you essentially facilitate the practice of the local people. And that can be helping them to learn about the healthcare that you provide in your country, how they can adapt what they do. It can be about essentially supporting what they're doing already with not only the training, but equipment, funds to try and change their manner of working. And what people often forget about all this is it's not just doctors. The nursing staff do an incredible job of making nurses in other countries recognize their own value. We value nurses in this country more than anything. And I think COVID demonstrated that to most of the population that without our nurses, we would have all been in a terrible state of affairs. It's the nurses who really, really upheld the NHS and they're respected, even though they're not rewarded in other countries around the world. It feels like they have a sense of not knowing their own worth and the interactions they have with the doctors and the surgeons can sometimes sort of show that to us. So we teach them empowerment. We make them embrace things like what is called the WHO, the World Health Organization Surgical Safety Checklist, which means that every individual in the team introduces themselves by their name. And I suspect some of the nurses will be very surprised if the surgeons even know their name. So this is just an opportunity here is who I am. Here is my role. And now for the rest of the day, we can interact on a more personal level. And that's a real sort of ground leveler. So even teaching basic practices like that, which are so established across the NHS, is a real kind of game changer elsewhere in the world. And then on top of that, we take individuals who are technicians, biomedical engineers, who are incredibly capable. I'm I'm always amazed at what they can fix and how imaginative they are with their repairs. But they teach these sort of skills and this resourcefulness to local people who I have to admit probably have as much resourcefulness because let's face it, they work with nothing on a daily basis. But just the ideas and manner in which they can adapt or use new equipment and service things that they may never have seen before, the biomedical engineers do that. So the team is about really enhancing everything that is already in place, but in a way that is integrated with the team. So you're not there as some external higher authority, you're there to work alongside them, see what they do, see how well they do it and say, well, you know, we do things differently sometimes, but I'm really impressed with the way you do what you do. Here is how we do it. Perhaps you can learn from it. Sometimes they come with particular needs. Surgeons will say to us very specifically, I need to know this technique or I need to know this procedure. Sometimes we will say there are skills that we can provide you, training in resuscitation, training in other aspects of healthcare that you may not have considered as relevant, but we would say they are and let's help you develop that. Before you take us around the world to some of the places you've been to, I'm looking forward to hearing about Mongolia too, because I know that was your first trip. And I think I've seen you quoted as saying that was one of your favorite trips. I'm looking forward to that. But just for those who haven't heard of the Flying Eye Hospital, from the outside, apart from the fact it's got a big eye on the side, it looks like a DC-10 cargo aircraft. The magic happens inside. Can you give us a sense of what it's like inside or what kind of facilities you have? The Flying Eye Hospital is one of the most exciting bits about Orbis, but it's not all that Orbis is. But let's start at the beginning. So perhaps the Flying Eye Hospital is why I ended up volunteering for Orbis. I always had an interest in doing aid work. I've worked with other charities along the way. Orbis is the one charity I've stayed fixed to because I really appreciate what they offer and how they do it and how I'm integrated into their team. But going way back, and I imagine I could only have been about... 10 or 11, traveling with my parents from the UK back to India to visit family in an airport. I think I spotted the Flying Eye Hospital. And I said to my mom, what is that plane? She wasn't sure. She did some research. She came back to me and said, oh, that's the Flying Eye Hospital. And they do operations. And I was fascinated with the idea of this plane doing surgeries mid-flight. Clearly, that doesn't happen. (laughs) But as a 10-year-old, your imagination goes wild. And I just thought to myself back then, I could do something like that, couldn't I? And so medicine came to me. I qualified as a doctor. I ended up becoming an anaesthetist rather than an eye surgeon, but I still managed to sort of get myself on board the Flying Eye Hospital. So I'm quite proud of myself for having achieved a a childhood goal. My parents think it's slightly ironic after that early experience. So the plane itself came about in the 80s. I think it was a DC-8 originally. Then it changed to a DC-10. And now the most current incarnation is an MD-10. And if you spend enough time with the crew, you become very 
very nerdy about the details of such <laughs> things. I try not to, but it, it is quite fascinating. So the latest incarnation of the plane is incredible because it was custom built. It was built with like a modular insert. So the fuselage contains these different modules that allow the whole scope of what Orbis wants to deliver to be done. So let's start with the operating room. It's a, it's a state-of-art operating room. Once you're inside it, you would not realize you could be anywhere in the world in an airplane. It resembles any operating room anywhere in the world. Slightly more sort of claustrophobic, the anesthetic machine, the setup, everything is very familiar. What it does have is an incredible network of audio visual aids so that every aspect of what is being done can be filmed and then can be displayed on a screen in an adjoining classroom room further on the plane, essentially where the normal seats are. So the, the actual class, the local doctors, nurses who might be invited to attend, sit down in normal airline seats, look on a screen and quite often now wearing 3D glasses. So they get a proper three-dimensional view of what's happening in the operating room. It's as if they're looking into the microscope with the surgeon's That's blowing. extraordinary, isn't it? Which is remarkable. You cannot achieve that in many of these countries because the technology isn't there. So you take the technology there and you use it as powerfully as you can. In addition, there are some rooms set aside for simulation with some very high fidelity simulators to train in cataract surgery and other procedures so that people can actually hone their skills in a way that's safe and very repetitive and very, very calm with a surgeon maybe from another country sitting alongside them or even one of their own colleagues sitting alongside them talking them through the steps. Simulation training is essentially the bottom line for almost every safety and quality that we like to introduce into healthcare as we do in the aviation industry. It's the bottom line. If you train well on a simulator, you can move on to the real life situations with a lot more preparedness and a lot more sort of scope for dealing with an emergency or a problem. Alongside the operating room, there's a recovery room because clearly the patients who've had a general anaesthetic need to spend some time recovering, and that's fully equipped as any other recovery room in the world. And then there's a whole section of the plane which is designed for cleaning the instruments, processing them. The nature of the plane is it's fully integrated. They have an audio-visual room where the essential the, the technicians can manage the process of passing on the screening, both locally into the classroom, but internationally through satellite to anywhere in the world. So you can have the surgery that's being done here and now in Ethiopia being viewed in the United States or wherever else you'd want it to be viewed. And all of this is happening aboard a plane in an airfield, somewhere very, very isolated often enough. And the feedback that you get from local medics and also local patients, I would imagine must be very rewarding. Well, the plane experience is often sort of quite overwhelming, both especially for the patients, I think, you know, some of them never have been on a plane before. So they're slightly unnerved by the experience of coming on board a plane, thinking about having an operation there. The actual staff themselves who come aboard appreciate the way the technology is being geared up to help them. But I sometimes find that my more satisfying experiences have been when we go to the local hospital. So every time the Flying Eye Hospital is any one location, there are usually two teams one that stay and operate in the Flying Eye Hospital and the other goes to the local hospital. And that way, there's a diversification of perhaps different operative kind of procedures, different surgeons, the potential to do different types of surgery. So more often than not, we set a limit on the plane as to the youngest child that we'll operate on for safety reasons. In case there's a problem, managing that in a very isolated environment is just asking for trouble. So we try and avoid that by being very selective. So the smaller children, the babies, would be done in the local hospital where there's a full hospital to support us. And my interest in anaesthetics is very much about the paediatrics. And that's where I like to work. And it's just that much more interesting to work in an environment that is so different to your own, so unfamiliar. And yet it then allows you to really integrate with the local folks because you have to then see it from their eyes. This is how you work on a daily basis. There's no point talking about sophisticated anaesthetic techniques that I use in London when they're not relevant. So let's do it the way you do it. And let me talk to you about why you do it the way you do, because you'll teach me something. There's no doubt about it. I learned so much from the local doctors. And perhaps I can offer you some tips on the way I do my work that might help you here. So that's really fascinating and really interesting. And then it's also a case of you get to wander around the local hospitals. So you really do get to soak up the local culture and meet a lot more people. Uh, it's a bit of a busman's holiday, admittedly, 
but it's really interesting. And that's what gives you the pleasure and the joy. What are the biggest learnings you think that you've taken away from people you've met in those communities? And are there any skills or techniques that you thought, actually, I'll take that back with me and that will inspire me at Moorfields? There is one particular technique that I have used and kept using, which comes from almost a background of sustainability as well. So there's a particular anaesthetic technique. We deliver anaesthetic around the eye. In the UK, we use a preformed metal curved needle, which is blunt at the tip, which is called a subtenons needle. It used to be very expensive. Now they're mass produced. So from being 10 to 15 pounds for each needle, they're now pennies. But back in the day when I was going to Zambia, I felt that it was useful to teach this technique because it's a far safer technique than the traditional way to anaesthetize the eye with a sharp needle. Sharp needles have a tendency to have very severe complications, rarely, but there is the chance. So this is a very much a safe, fail safe, you know, very sort of foolproof technique. And what I used was an intravenous cannula, the plastic insert from that. Ah, interesting. Because you get those everywhere in the world. And I discussed it with a lovely colleague of mine at the time who is now a consultant in another hospital, but at the time he was a trainee and he was from Zambia and he was the greatest source of support and information. He said, well, why don't you try this technique? And this technique worked to treat. Not only was it effective there, but what I realized was it was more comfortable, definitely less traumatic, And generally, just a kinder experience on everybody because the whole thing worked smoothly. It didn't feel fiddly. It didn't feel painful. And it delivered the outcomes that you wanted. And at the time, it was a cost saving even when I brought it back to the NHS because each component was 10, 15 pounds cheaper. So it was a win-win all round. But because of its comfort and its I I think it's effectiveness. I still use it now. That's a shout out to Dr. Akotia. Well done. Good shout out there. And it's nice as well that it's a two-way street. And you can tell, Manish, as well with your personality that people would warm to you so easily. You're not walking in there telling them how to do it. It's sharing experiences, learnings, isn't it? And I'm sure you're welcome with open arms when you go into that kind of environment. I am fascinated for you to zip me around the world a little bit. Shall we start with Mongolia and, and what your first trip for Orbis was? like? So Mongolia was exciting because it was my first trip. I had to fly via Russia, which was a very odd experience in the first instance, stopping in Moscow airport and then connecting into Mongolia. But I was greeted by my fabulous colleague, Dr. Lord, who is an Orbis volunteer and well-established ahead of me. He met me at the airport, took me back and got me set up. And what Mongolia offered was I can think of three clear memories. The first one, meeting one of my interpreters who just spoke the most perfect English, so amazed at how well she was able to act as an interpreter and also balance in medical terminology. And chatting to her, what came apparent was she had been a patient of Orbis years previously as a baby, as a child. Oh, wow. That's so amazing. So she had experienced the value of Orbis and had some surgical correction to a squint So she was not somebody who lost her vision as a result of something that's entirely addressable and realized that she had a lot to offer. One to study, go to university, become incredibly intelligent and very, very eloquent, being able to speak multiple languages. And when the Orbis opportunity arose, she was straight back there doing her bit to return the favor. Fantastic. it, It was fantastic. You know, you don't get to meet people like that very often. So that was amazing. The second part of the package was the celebrity There was a surprise visit from Daniel Craig and Rachel Weisz. As an Orbis charity's kind of sponsor, they were asked to come and visit. And I think it created a bit of a furore on the plane because it was quite exciting. You know, this was James Bond coming. Come on, that's 007. That's quite exciting. It's it's pretty fun. And Rachel Weisz too. Uh, Totally. She's not too shabby either. Totally. So clearly there were those who were allowed to meet and those who were not. (laughs) (laughs) And um, as the newcomer, I was chosen to not be one that met them. The feedback was very positive. They had a great time on the plane. They were very engaging. And given the fact they'd flown in on some ridiculous this red eye flight, they just was perky as and really sort of embraced the idea of seeing what Orbis did. 
But as a result, I was nudged out to the um, the local hospital where I was slightly kind of shocked at what I was being asked to do. So there were surgeons who were present who were what were called vitreoretinal surgeons. They work in the back of the eye. They didn't want to do a surgical procedure so much as simply deliver some injections of medication to the back of the eyes of some babies. Now, these babies were babies that had been born prematurely and had a condition called retinopathy or prematurity, which can be a major, major problem when prematurity is handled in a way that is just desperate at the time. Smaller babies especially suffer a lot more and places where there are very minimal resources, the management of these children are very difficult and the retinopathy or prematurity is more of a problem. And it's almost the middle income countries where this is the worst outcome because the low income countries, these babies will just die. Simple as that. The prematurity cannot be managed well. Here, the babies will be kept alive, but then all the damage and the consequences will make itself known. And these babies may well be born sight, well, grow up sightless into children who are sightless. So one of the potential treatments were these injections to essentially limit the growth of the vasculature and the, essentially the lifting off the retina. And sounds straightforward. Let's give an injection. But then you remember they are babies and babies don't really like having much done to them. So some sort of anesthetic technique was necessary. And this is where the challenge came in because at least one of the two babies I was presented with was only 35 weeks and had already had a cardiac arrest in their life. This would not be something that would even come to Moorfields Eye Hospital. This would be done with my very, very, very high level colleagues at Great Ormond Street. And I respect them for their ability to manage such cases. But I had to do something because the whole teaching, the technique rested upon make this happen. I kept phoning the plane and asking, and I said, we know you can find a solution, find a solution. So finally, witness my child, who was at that time merely a baby. And I thought, he's very sleepy after a feed, and we just need to swaddle him. Let's go along that path. So the mother's breastfed the child. I did some swaddling, much to everyone's amusement. <laughs> I put some drops in their eyes, and I said to the surgeon, you probably have about five minutes, in which time they're not going to stir. They're not going to feel what you're going to do. I'd get on and do it. And off they did. And they got a very good teaching opportunity out of it. The local surgeons got on and saw what was done, how it was done. And I'm not sure if that was the perfect anaesthetic technique, but it was the anaesthetic technique that worked there and then and did not put us into any danger. And that's what what this is about. Bottom line, find a solution, make it work and help other people to learn about it. Well, Mongolia certainly sounds interesting. I suppose they probably all stand out, but which other ones would you highlight and for what reasons? I Um, like you taking us around the world. Yeah, Zambia, fabulous, truly, truly fascinating country. Probably of all the countries I've been to, the one that showed the most marked poverty, but with people who are just so upbeat. And I was with another consultant who's a lovely chap who worked at King's College Hospital. And the two of us were completely confounded at the end of the day by this gorgeous, chubby little African baby who we could not put an intravenous cannula into. We could not place a drip. And we just thought, what are we going to do? We're going to have to abandon the surgery. We spoke to the surgeon and they said, it's okay. We've had a long day. Let's leave this till tomorrow. We'll come back and do this case as one of our cases tomorrow. Okay, that's fine. The next morning, this child appears in the operating room with the cannula already in place. And the two of us just looked at each other amazed. The nurse on the ward had done it overnight. All I can say is there are skilled professionals everywhere in the world and you should never take it for granted. We insisted this poor woman come to the operating room so we could just hug her. Because (laughs) it was just like, thank you so much. But... Just amazing. Oh, that is incredible. And what about the people you've met along the way? There must be some real people that stand out that you'll never forget. There's definitely a lovely chap in Vietnam who was my interpreter, but was trained to be a medical student who just was a sponge. Anything you told him, he would absorb, retain, go and research and come and question you some more about it. He would ask me some questions about those technical aspects of physiology. And I I found myself slightly overwhelmed at the amount of information he wanted from me. So truly, truly lovely. Jamaica, the personalities in Jamaica are all just so lovable. On that trip, I traveled with the lovely Nadine, who's one of my nurses from Moorfields, who is incredible. And I've loved her from the moment I've met her at Moorfields because she just gives so much. We had dinner with her aunt while we were there and we had lots of lovely experiences. But everyone slightly resembled her, that larger than life personality and that real sense of generosity. And we were chatting, myself and the anesthetic trainee that I was with, 
talking about tricks that we use to make kids cooperate. And I said, it's a shame, you know, I've started to resort to that really cheap trick, which is take out my phone, I find a game, I play a game <laughs> with them, they're distracted and I quickly get a needle in. She said, that's just terrible. We can't do that sort of thing here. She said, I'll show you what I do. So the next child came in, five or six, potted in, looking a little bit bashful about everything. And she just put out her arms and said, come and give me a hug. <laughs> <laughs> and this child did that. It was just so gorgeous, the sense of lovingness. And I just thought, wow, probably not one for the NHS, but it was a lovely way that people interacted there. There was a genuine sense that people really looked out for each other. I know that you do like to get off the aircraft and get into the community. When you finished work and you're in a local hospital, do you get time to hang out with some of the locals then and feel that you're part of the, you know, experience some of the culture and feel wherever you are? Sadly, not always. I think there are still some social barriers that perhaps the local people feel. And the reality is their lives go on. But we always try to have some event and the events can be so memorable. In Peru, one of the staff nurses on the Orbis plane itself is Peruvian and was so proud that we were in her country and created an event which really brought together both the visiting doctors from Orbis and the local doctors who were working with us and made the whole event a real party. In Mongolia, the Minister of Health came along and threw an incredible dinner and everyone was invited, ourselves and the local doctors. So that was a very sort of levelling experience because we were all slightly in awe of the fact that some very major dignitary was there throwing what was a very lavish meal and entertainment with these incredible throat singers. The countries are all fascinating for their histories, their cultures, and any opportunity to get in there is great. And you're right, having that pathway into the local people's existences is just an honour when you're in this environment. And when you go to some of the different countries you've mentioned, are there different eye problems in different countries? Do you go to certain countries where cataracts perhaps are a, a big problem? What kind of things are you sorting out? I feel I should kind of throw at you some of the statistics that Orbis hold. So of the world's population, about 1.1 billion people suffer some level of sight loss, whether that be complete blindness or some sight loss. 90% of that is actually avoidable. Is it? So there are so many interventions that can be done from simple glasses for correction of poor refraction to the use of antibiotics to the use of surgery. And the sad thing is nine out of 10 people with this problem will come from a low or middle income country. So this is where Orbis is sending the resources. So for an example, in Ethiopia, Orbis has been heavily involved for space of a good 10 to 15 years. And the problem there is trachoma, which is an infection. It's a bacterial infection. It essentially will be transmitted from person to person, poor hygiene contributes. But once it's in a population, it's really hard to get it out of the population and it will just keep infecting people. So although you may get the infection and you clear it yourself, a few weeks later, you get the infection again. And that repetition of that cycle means that you get a fibrosis and a tightening of your eyelids. The eyelids themselves will turn in and your eyelashes will start scratching your cornea oh my and then you lose your vision. And that's just ridiculous. It's so easily treatable by a single antibiotic. And what you need to do is just treat a whole population fully and expansively as possible. And so Orbis ends up being the vehicle by which local healthcare providers are able to resource this, but also are able to distribute it to inform and educate people. All those things that as much as they'd want to do locally, they'd find difficult to do. So Orbis just acts as like the vehicle for them and works with them to do those things. And it has an amazing impact. And in other places, yeah, we'll teach surgery and we'll teach surgery that is relevant. So in Bangladesh, you'll be teaching cataract surgery. In Vietnam, where the sort of level of economic development is high, there's a lot more diabetes now. And you'll be teaching surgery that deals with diabetic retinopathy. So it's all very much tailored to the needs of the local population and getting those techniques that are relevant really, really ensconced in the surgeons there. And even in the pandemic when, well, pretty much all aircraft were grounded and certainly the Orbis Flying Hospital was grounded, virtual training was delivered, I think, to the five countries. I think the Eye Hospital was due to visit Bolivia, Zambia, Cameroon, Mongolia and India. And that's extraordinary, isn't it, to think that the work still carried on 
Were you involved during the pandemic in that kind of training or some training? Sadly not. My first commitment during the pandemic was to the NHS. So um, I spent time initially at the Nightingale and then subsequently at the Royal Free Hospital in a sort of voluntary redeployment role. One of the things about the COVID pandemic, I think people realised was the nature of anaesthetic doctors and their abilities and the roles. It's very much what we do. We manage that sort of problem. And we were all mobilised and essentially invited to help where we can. And that's what I did. But I feel that Orbis definitely recognised one of the tools they have in their armoury. One is the Flying Eye Hospital. Two are the hospital-based programmes where you support a local hospital or eye clinic, sometimes with simple resources, sometimes with education that might be a resource that goes there or people that go there and provide the education. And finally, with this incredible thing called CyberSight, which is this virtual platform that allows people to consult remotely. So people can literally demonstrate an eye condition to a doctor in another country and ask them for their guidance using mobile phone technology, which is incredibly prevalent. So even in the poorest countries, there is a mobile network and there are mobile phones with effective cameras to do this. They can ask for guidance on management. They can ask for even surgeries to be viewed and conversations to be had over the time of the surgery. They can take on virtual reality approaches to training, whereby they can be tasked with learning new skills on this platform. So that in itself became a real major, major recognition in Orbis's part that this was a worthwhile investment that they'd started because they started off quite a few years ago. And that's given them very, very good payback because COVID was the perfect opportunity to really sort of put it to its test and its work to treat. And in addition to which, there's even the use of artificial intelligence as a diagnostic tool using CyberSight. So using it to identify disease states in other countries, helping doctors there who may be less familiar or who may not have the technology to do that themselves. The medical world has changed even in the years since you qualified. You've seen some extraordinary changes, haven't you? It must be very satisfying now seeing how you can help other countries and some of that be virtual. Very much so. I I would hope that there are always going to be doctors who do this. I'm one of many and I know that. And I'm so proud. Many, many people from the NHS, whether they're doctors, nurses, volunteering, traveling to places to actually provide assistance on the ground or just contributing in some way or form with some of the resources that they have. And it's a big part of who we are and what we are. If you reflect on the NHS in this country, it is like the United Nations in any hospital. There are more nationalities represented, more individuals from everywhere all working together without too much of a problem as far as I can see and and sort of almost teasing each other about our national traits and characteristics. I often declare myself as an African in Morfields because I was born in Uganda, came over here as a very, very young refugee immigrant. And I'm sort of quite bemused by the fact that I still have this sense of wanting to return to Africa every so often and get involved in what happens there without really having much familiarity with it. Every time I've gone, whether it be to Ghana, to Zambia or some of the other countries I've visited, it's been a real voyage of discovery. And I find it just so rewarding. And those populations are incredibly, incredibly upbeat. You know, they have achieved so much politically, economically, and what they need now is just that step up in their healthcare so that they can be as safe and comfortable as we are. We are very lucky in this country. As much as the NHS is burdened by strain, we are lucky to have it. Oh, we are very, very lucky to have it. It's funny because at this stage of the podcast, usually when I'm winding down, I've gone into background and history and found out where you grew up and all that kind of thing. But your story is about being on the road for Orbis and what you do have been so fascinating. I've not really dabbled into that. So as we sort of approach the end, yes. why anesthesia? A little bit about maybe your childhood. Oh, you just so said you're born in Uganda. So my parents are originally from India, although my father had been born in Uganda himself from his father emigrating there. Myself and my brother were born in Uganda. We're very small. We were part of the Ugandan Asian population that left Uganda under the time of Idi Amin. I grew up in this country. I think I was here from the age of two. I do not recognize any other country as my own apart from this country. In fact, I almost feel so partisan that I am a Londoner. Absolutely. Londoner first and foremost. If I asked where am I from, I would always say London first, and then people struggle with knowing which city, which country that is in, I'll, you know, England, UK, but it's London. London is where I feel most at home. Everything about London just fits with me and I fit with it. So I'm very proud of this city. I'm very proud of what it does. And 
Very proud of the people in it. Always wanted to live here. My parents made the mistake of moving out to Kent. I'm very happy living in London. And I went to medical school in London, King's College. I was going to say, apart from spotting <laughs> the eye hospital at that very tender age of about 10 in India yes. with your mum, what was it that drew you to medicine and question. indeed anaesthesia? Yeah, this an interesting question. I wonder if I am sort of stereotypical Indian child of my generation where your parents would say to you, do something very good, like be a professional, be an accountant, an engineer or a doctor. I may well have been trapped by that. I, I toyed with the idea of being a lawyer for a long time because I liked the idea of the sort of jousting that you do with language and with speech and with words. But in the end, I did become a doctor. I did decide that maybe that would suit me the best. Once I'd finished my training, my first job was in the accident emergency department after I'd finished my basic jobs at King's College Hospital. One of the things I'd recognized was whenever there was a problem in any specialty area that became just too much, you'd call the anaesthetist because the anaesthetist would always have the solution. And the solution would often be, let's just take this patient over. You'd anaesthetize them, essentially create a coma as is the common parlance on the news shows. This patient was in, put in an induced coma. It's an anaesthetic. Being on the intensive care is a long ongoing anaesthetic. And that in itself is about managing the patient's condition. So very knowledgeable about physiology, which is the way the body works. And it's fascinating. It is truly fascinating being a doctor that not only knows it, understands it, but manipulates it. So all of that was truly, truly part of the draw and the ability to always be present to resuscitate, to be the person who you knew could essentially bring somebody back from the point of death was a big part of what made anaesthetics exciting. Clearly, when you become a consultant, there's a lot less of that because you're not there all hours. And in the nature of the job I do now at Moorfields, it's much less disconnected from that. But it was still what made me do it. And then just getting pleasure from doing it well. So every time you do an anaesthetic, you realize there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lot of sense of unspoken fear and patience that you either have to acknowledge or you just have to deal with and make their experience as good as it can be. And I know that's what myself and all my colleagues out there in the country do. We just do that and we do it well. And we are very much sensitive to that, even though we're the very unseen doctors, the ones that nobody really knows or recognizes. Perhaps COVID brought us into the spotlight for a while, but I don't think many of us are that fussed whether we stay in the spotlight. We like our jobs and we do it well. Finally, Manish, I've been doing a lot of work in the NHS in the sustainability field. And as you'll well know, the NHS has an ambition to be the world's first net zero health service. I've been hosting panels with five anaesthetists on the panel talking about anaesthetic gas. Tell me what you're doing with that and whether you are looking at alternatives which will be kinder to our planet. It's a big, big story. So healthcare definitely contributes a major amount of the carbon dioxide emissions of any country. In the US, it's almost 10% of the national emissions. In this country, it's 5% of the national emissions. How do you address it? You have to look at each component. Probably some of the biggest components is how we buy and how we use devices and equipment and whether we should be constantly kind of trying to use things only once rather than cleaning them like we historically did and reusing them. Never was a problem in the past. Somehow got very, very foggy. We felt the need to go to single-use items. That's somewhere that needs to be addressed. But as anaesthetists, we know one thing, that the gases that we use for anaesthetic are a potent source of climate change because the halogenated vapours, the gas that might be turned on the machine that would keep you asleep, will go up into the atmosphere and act as absorbance of energy, which will be reflected back onto the planet, hence global heating. There's also another gas that is used that is very pervasive elsewhere in the world, is still used in the UK, but not necessarily by anaesthetists so much, but maybe more so on the labour ward, Entonox, or by a &E departments. And that's nitrous oxide, you know, commonly used on the street as well. That's a superbly toxic gas, really, really toxic. The problem with that is it's used in such large volumes that its effect, although it's smaller than that some of the anaesthetic vapours, the large volumes of it mean the problem is that massive, absolutely massive. And not only does it have this global heating consequence, it also depletes the ozone layer. And then on top of that, it doesn't clear from the atmosphere for at least 100 years. So the less we use it, the better we're all going to be. So we're all finding that we can work without nitrous, apart from in those environments such as the labor ward and the emergency department. There are techniques that are being developed to capture the nitrous. So if people breathe it from a mask that's close fitting, what they breathe out is captured 
not released into the atmosphere because for so long we've been very guilty of just letting it go out into the atmosphere where it causes problems. As for the the vapors that we might use for the anesthetic, at Morfills I'm very lucky. I'm able to use very expensive techniques which are intravenous. So all of the anesthetic I gave is given through an intravenous route. It's just purely oxygen and air and that is a very clean approach. Not everywhere can actually move on to doing that because it's costly in terms of equipment, costly in terms of drugs. And we still don't know what the consequence of using large amounts of those drugs. But it's all about making ourselves aware and try and think about why you're using things. Try and avoid things that don't need to have this single-use quality attached to them. So reusing would be better than throwing away. And generally, just spreading the word making people recognize that this is important. Healthcare is a really important contributor. There are so many other aspects though. So travel, telemedicine contributes by stopping us having to travel into hospitals. The energy we use, maybe we should be sourcing it from kinder sources. We're one of the biggest uses of energy in the country. All of these things, the NHS has a big responsibility to stand up to. Very positive note to end on, actually, to hearing the kind of work that's going on there. I knew, having sat next to you at an August dinner, that you'd be a fascinating podcast. I'm glad I didn't ask at that dinner about your adventures, because I think everybody tells them best first time round. And it's just been a real treat, Manish. Thank you so much for making time and welcoming me into your home today. It's been great. Well, thank you very much, Ellen. I'm very honoured to be the guest. You've been listening to consultant anaesthetist Dr. Manish Raval from Moorfields Eye Hospital in London and a much appreciated volunteer on the Orbis Flying Hospital, sharing his experiences and stories from working in the field. I hope you've enjoyed Manish's stories as much as I have. Download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back next week with another inspirational guest and I won't need to say anaesthesia or any of those tricky words. I look forward to your company then. 